Here I am wanting to discuss the English Civil War. This is an important development in world history. It's a critical development in American history and English history. It's the moment when England begins to become more democratic as opposed to living under a monarchy. There has been growing in Europe an absolutist or absolutism. Have you heard of absolutism as a political philosophy held by some kings? Absolutism. You heard of this? We're going to have an absolute monarch who is in control of all things. They will make the law. They will have the legislative function. They'll make the law. They will carry out the law. And they will, they will appoint judges who will listen to them and who will determine whether or not someone has broken the law. The most famous and complete system like this was Louis XIV in France. Absolutism is this idea that the people listen to the king and the king forms a government and the king runs everything through his ministers and his judges and his top officials. Do we like that kind of system? We don't like that kind of system. We like government to be reflective of the people, right? And that would be democracy as opposed to monarchy. Well, in this English Civil War, We've got the Stuart dynasty, which I gave you guys last time, and that's going to be James I, who's come down from Scotland, and then his son Charles. Now, you know what I want to say about James when he comes down from Scotland. When he meets Parliament, he gives them a speech. In that speech, he talks about the divine right of kings. He says that kings are God's chosen lieutenants for the people of the earth, and that in his kingdom, he is might as well be God, right? Because he is... God's representative. And they need to completely listen to them like they would give over authority to God if he were walking among them. That's how he wants his subjects to treat him. Now, there's been a long tradition in England, going back to about a thousand, something called Parliament. They had created, they'd forced upon a king in the Magna Carta, the right to consult with the king on certain laws. At this document, the Magna Carta had created the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. Various different titled positions, like the Earl of this, and the Baron of that, and the Duke of this, would all be able to sit in the House of Lords. And they could come together, and they would have, before the king could do certain things, the only thing he could really do, he had to call them together if he wanted to go to war, and he had to call them together if he wanted to raise taxes, right? Because those are the two big things that people get most upset about. The House of Commons was made up of boroughs around the country, and people would send representatives there. But they weren't elected based on democracy, but based on townships and things like that. It's a very limited form of representative government. This parliament could only come together if the king called them. Right? He would invoke parliament. He would call them together. He would present what he wanted them to do, and they would give him what he wanted. And then they would go home. If they ever started acting in a way that he did not like, he would dismiss parliament. And if they tried to come together separately, and come up with some policies they wanted to force on the king, he would accuse them of treason. And that would be a very dangerous thing. So we have a very limited representative government here. James I only called Parliament once. It was because he got in a war with another country and he needed taxes. The government didn't, the uh, people didn't want to pay it, and so he sent them home. This is his son, Charles I, who takes over. Both James and Charles have got a problem in their hand. They're involved in various wars. They're trying to grow their government, and they're short on money. I will say this about James and Charles. They would go through the documents in the castles looking for old laws and old maybe fees that used to be imp imposed on the people by former monarchs. And they would say, because this monarch 500 years ago authorized this, I'm going to authorize it too, and I don't have to call parliament. And that irritated the English people that he would revive these old laws and try to get around parliament for raising taxes. Another thing the kings would do is that they would announce that they were coming to visit someone, a duke, and they would go and spend a lot of time with them, and they wouldn't leave with their men until the man gave them a loan. These were called forced loans. And they had no intention of paying these loans back, but it was a way for the kings to get some money. So the kings were using their strength to try to arrange things for themselves. They also stationed troops where they wanted to, and they accused people sometimes of, um, of treason, and they would bring them before something called the Star Chamber. So he would pick the, the jury, and they would find usually in favor of the king. So parliament, the average people are getting nervous that their kings are trying to move 
towards absolutism like the French. That's their fear in England. And they're getting rather nervous, but they don't know how to, how to stop the, this slide towards absolutism. In the 1630s, Charles goes to war with a variety of countries, Spain and France he has trouble with, and he calls Parliament together and he says, I need you guys to raise taxes for the war effort. And they say, before we do that, we have a list of things we want to propose to you. We don't like these forced loans and we don't like you putting troops wherever you want to. And we don't like the Star Chamber and we want to be consulted more often. They put a petition to him saying, if you, we want these things from you, we want more control here of government. And he dismisses them. He says, go home, I'll do this without you. And so he does try to fight it on without them. He gets into a problem, however, with Scotland. The Scottish go up in a rebellion over his leadership up there as he tries to get rid of or undermine Presbyterian form of government. He has to call Parliament back in the late 1630s. He tries it again. They again put this petition to him. And he dismisses them again and says, I'll go without you. However, what has happened here is this guy, Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is a wealthy landowner. He has also seen military service. He's got that petty nobleman background. He's a Puritan. He's a Puritan. He's one of these followers of the theology of John Calvin. And he is in favor of more democracy. Not for everyone, like the average people, but at least the property people being able to have more of a say in government. So he's a Puritan, he's in favor of more representative government, he's fairly wealthy, he's seen military service, and he becomes the leader of the opposition to the king, which is dangerous to do. He and many other like-minded men who think the king is encroaching upon ancient English rights established in the Magna Carta. And so when Parliament refuses again to work with Charles, Charles has been sending over people to investigate who are the troublemakers. And they single out Cromwell and about five other men who were leading this opposition to King. And the King tries to arrest them. And he's planning to try them for treason. Cromwell and company get wind of this and they escape London before they get captured. Once they get outside of London, they say that King has lost his right to govern. And he is in fact, the one who's committing treason against English rights. And that leads us to an English civil war. The war is between Cromwell and his faction, which are called the Roundheads, against the king and his supporter, his supporters, who were called the Cavaliers. Cromwell is an inspirational leader, and he uses a new uh, approach to military, being able to introduce cavalry attacks again in a way that are very effective, and the use of firearms that are effective. And his forces finally defeat Charles I and capture him. And now they're like, what do we do with him? And they do something they've never done in England. They decide to try him for treason and then they, they go ahead and execute him. And they get rid of this monarch because they're saying, we cannot trust this man to govern the way the English people have the right to be governed. Now, unfortunately, we can't come up yet with an alternate to monarchy. How do we create a leadership? How do we have a government? Well, the person who steps in is Cromwell. Yes, I'm happy to. Did they execute him with an axe? Yeah, I'm not sure if they used an axe or a sword. Because the picture has an axe, but he was a king. They, they I, didn't use a sword. I don't know. Well, no, in, in Germany they usually use a sword, but I don't know. Is, uh, the all noble Got the sword? Sword, because that's... Instead of the axeman, right? It, yes, it would be. A, that's a good question. This is an early depiction, early etching of it. I do know that people in the crowd try to get parts of his blood on handkerchiefs and things like that because the king had put forward that he was divine, practically. And and this is a period of time when Europeans still had lots of superstitions and stuff, and they thought maybe that blood, if it was divine, then it would be useful in curing this disease or that disease or bring you good luck and things like that. Uh, many people were uh, dumbfounded by the fact that they actually executed a person who had been suggesting that he was God on earth, and they thought, what is that going to be for us? And that's not correct. And St. Peter and both Paul both said, God has established all governments and we are to accept the leadership of our magistrates. What do we do about this? So this was conflicting here. We've got an intersection of religion and politics here. Cromwell becomes Lord Protector of England. That's what he calls himself, Lord Protector of England. He does not introduce Republican form of government. 
And when I say Republican, I don't mean the Republican Party, but I mean the, re the creation of a republic. A republic is something that has no king. It has elected leaders. He does not form a republic. Republics are pretty rare until the modern age when the United States becomes the first one to do it in the modern period. Um, I want to look at two ideas here. I've got John Locke is your main one and Thomas Hobbes. This has to do with the development of political philosophy about what society needs in terms of government. These are two conflicting viewpoints. Thomas Hobbes is a monarchist. He, he prefers monarchy. He's got the bottom. He does not trust people. He thinks people are bound to mess things up horribly and that the kings and earls and dukes and knights will always struggle together, they'll always take advantage of or they'll always go into war and we need the king to preside over the people. Here's an interesting picture that is associated with his book Leviathan in which the king is made up of the people and he is the state and the state protects the people and it keeps them from messing everything up. Hobbes says that human nature is such that if you leave them to themselves they will live short brutish lives in misery and chaos will reign and we need a strong government and strong leadership by one. John Locke, who many of us see as the, the father of democracy in the modern period, had a more positive look at humans and he thought humans could make rational decisions, could constrain themselves. As he thinks that all governments are formed by humans. At some point in time, he says something that happened called a social contract. Social contract is this idea that we give over individual power to a government. And that government has authority over us. But we do so because a government can protect three things, which are our rights. And those are our right to... You want to try it? What are the three basic human rights that we begin to propose and are presented in our Declaration of Independence? We have the right to L, life, liberty, liberty. The pursuit of happiness is what is how Jefferson changes it later on. But John Locke says, and property. We have the right to our life, our liberty, and our property. The reason governments are formed is to stop the bad people out there who would take your life, would take your liberty, make you slaves of you or serfs of you, or take your property without your consent. Governments are to protect the individuals and the government only has the right to take these things from you with just cause. That is, if you've broken the law. John Locke says the only reasons governments exist is to protect these things. And he says that James and Charles had broken the social contract because they were taking the life and liberty and property of people without the consent and they themselves were a threat to society. And if you, if you break the social contract, if you are no longer serving the function that you were originally planned for, the people have the right to overthrow that government and form a new government. By the way, that is what we say in the Declaration of Independence. But we've got to get some theory in this regard beginning to develop. And that's why John Locke's important. He is English. He's living in England. And he is this person who's becoming an advocate for we would, what we now say constrained government, constitutional government, or uh, even democracy. Hobbes believes in authority. He prefers a strong country because people always mess things up. And we have tended to vacillate back and forth between these two things. So frequently we want to come back to authority. Because sometimes it's true. Left to themselves, humans, bad humans especially, emerge and take advantage of the average people. We give you lots of examples. Let's give you an example of Russia. In the 1990s, when they lost the Soviet leadership, lots of thugs emerged in government and chaos reigned and they had crime spiked and they had all kinds of problems. And the people of Russia elected Vladimir Putin, who promised to go after those bad people. And he, they gave him a lot of authority. Well, now he has all the authority and he controls all the aspects of the state practice. And so we've moved back to uh, Hobbes. So there's this place where we're trying to get good government and not have an authoritarian form of government. And that's where we're going to be moving. All right. Those are some important intellectual developments in the 1600s which we will come to play upon in the 1700s.